Hi, welcome back to Gage Hill Crafts. I'm Rick. And I'm Sarah. And today we're going to be catching you up on the mead that we started about five weeks ago. And uh, this is the process where we're going to be switching it from one main five gallon container into two, two and a half gallon containers where we're going to do one as a uh, mead and the other is a melon melt. Mm -hmm. So Sarah helped a bit, great deal today uh, with that process and we're going to get you all caught up. Well, actually, Rick's giving a lot more credit than this, too. Um, we've had a very, very lazy winter break. I hope you all have had some nice time off. Um, we had a huge Boxing Day party, uh, as we usually do. That's the day after Christmas. And uh, had some friends over for dinner. I was cooking for two days to get ready for that. And, uh, and then we had, of course, the aftermath day and the cleanup and all of that. And I have just been sitting on my butt knitting for about three days straight. And I've been so happy. Um, That's great. <laughs> I finished Rick's sweater. Um, this is the Isabel Kramer design with the hops. It's called Humulus. And uh, I'm very proud of that. And it fits Rick. I love it. Thank you very much. You're I'm... very welcome. I'm sorry. Um, so, you know, between finishing up the sweater and, and getting some other things done around the house, it's been pretty slow. So, but today was pretty productive. So uh, Rick was in the kitchen and I think the first thing you did was uh, sanitize, right? Well, that, yeah, exactly. Well, Nancy, uh, Sarah's mother, was helping us by making an elderberry juice that we use for the melomel -mel portion. And so I was waiting for her to cook it and get it right, nice and fresh and allow it to cool down. So that's a great time to sanitize your equipment so you're ready to go. You get an inventory of what items you need. And the great thing about mead is there's not really a lot here. So I just cleaned a couple of carboys, uh, cleaned a couple of airlocks, and cleaned my uh, thief to line to, or to transfer or rack the meads from the main vessel down to the two vessels. Mm -hmm. And the only things you used were a funnel and I think a measuring cup, and that was about it. Correct. Yeah, the measuring yeah. cup I just keep aside when I mix up some of the star sand the, uh, solution there and or the sanitizer. Um, I usually put a little bit into like a two gallon Pyrex or excuse me, a two cup Pyrex that I set aside and I clean utensils. I dip ends into things. I always try to keep using the sanitizer over and over and keeping it handy. Mm -hmm. Even keeping a vessel aside that I'm not planning on using in the brew day that is meant just to funnel off or to siphon off the sanitizer. It's always great to have on hand because if you clean, you're always going to have a really good product. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then the next step was, um, you noticed there were some sediment, so you decided to sort of do a pre-rack. Well, right. I, I always had thought I was going to switch it between two separate vessels and Sarah mentioned that one of these vessels was already perfectly utilized. So what I wanted to do is just move it over and kind of take off that bottom bit of sediment, which is going to be the dead yeast cells. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no yeast, uh, no use in introducing them back. We're going to be adding some fresh into the secondary uh, statement there. And so it's just best to keep them out. It'll help make a clearer type of mead later. Okay. Yeah. So you did one rack, mm -hmm. and then um, then by that time we had the juice, Correct. and we put that in, let it make, made sure it was room temperature so it wouldn't kill off any yeast. Correct, exactly. Right? I just want to keep it under the you know, 70 degrees or whatever because we mm -hmm. are going to be introducing yeast. Um, so we put that at the bottom, and then we racked the other mead on top of it, mm -hmm. and that turned it a beautiful purplish color, and you can really smell the honey being coming out as well as the elderberry juice. And then it's just a matter of getting the carboys with the airlocks and so we can set them aside and allow them to do some fermentation. Although I did notice that after the first maybe hour of having them uh, in the airlocks that the melomel, the one with the elderberry juice, wasn't really percolating. You can see there's some pressure in there. And so I decided to give it a little bit of a yeast nutrient boost in order to get it going. Mm -hmm. And just give it a little swirl, allowed some of the carbon dioxide to come off, and it was really percolating well there. So it needed a little help, I think, even with all those sugars. It was just too much. Yeah, I may have been overloading it. Can you do that? Sort of drown your yeast in too much food at, all at once? And Exactly. It, it could have been. It a little shot of sort of vitamins or something to get it going. Yeah. yeah, so I had already set aside the yeast, yeast, which was a dry yeast, and to just kind of rehydrated it and put a little pinch in the nutrients and allowed that to kind of warm up, put that to room temperature as well. And then I added it to the main and then racked it off uh, to the two. And it's fine in the mead one, which is just there, but those extra juices really seem to kind of stunt. So it was the same amount of yeast in each one, and one was going very strongly right away. Mm -hmm. And the other one just needs a little extra boost. And I'll just do that for the next couple of days just to make sure that it's, um, you know, that you're really accentuating the yeast that uh, you provided and not a water yeast. Right. Because we did pick these, um, Mom and I 
got the elderberries themselves from a friend's garden over the summer. We froze them to preserve them temporarily. And then um, she cooked cooked them thoroughly to get rid of the, um, the toxins that are naturally occurring in the elderberry. You never want to eat raw elderberry or introduce it raw into a mixture. You either need to ferment it or cook it or both um, to make sure that it's safe to, to consume. Um, and I think that cooking process probably drives off a lot of the wild yeast, but just just in case you want to kind of boost your your homemade yeast. Also, if your yeast has been sitting in cold storage for a little while, it might have been sort of dormant, and so you kind of want to wake it up and exactly. get it going. Together. Exactly. There was still going to be some yeast there, and just racking it and actually introducing some oxygen was going to help a little bit with that. But adding a little bit more yeast really can't hurt because the honey has so many sugars, you really got to give it a boost and uh, the yeast a chance to kind of eat through all those sugars. We did taste a little of the racking, mm -hmm. and it was delicious. Uh, still very sweet. Sweet, yeah. Um, which is fine. We're going to be aging this for a very long time. Our plan is to allow it to go in the cellar uh, down in our basement, which is about 55, 60 degrees all year round, and have that in Fahrenheit, and have that wait until late summer. And then by then it early, should... Yeah, late summer, early fall, right? right? And then bottle it then and allow it to even bottle condition for a little bit before oh, then. So we can okay. give it a little bit of a sparkle maybe at the end as well. Sure, yeah. I didn't I didn't factor in that time. So we're going to be moving it to one more vessel, which will be the bottle, right. and then allow it to build up some carbonation. I like a sparkly mead mm -hmm. um, myself. Mm -hmm. And we're going to be using it for special occasions and also um, giving it away to friends and family, so... Right. We'll definitely have a tasting at that point. All right. We'll know how it turns out. Yeah. So those were important points that Sarah made about the elderberries. And I'm using the term melamel, and that's not just because this is elderberries. Essentially, that is a term for any fruit in a mead. Mm -hmm. So feel free to look for other recipes or other fruits and try to do them seasonally when you pick them at their ripest. And then you can make that syrup that same day if you're going to be making melamel. It's really simple. Mm -hmm. And it'll just make a nice, pleasant color. Yeah, I think any berry would work well, you know, raspberries, wild cherries. Um, you could even use something like peach juice if mm -hmm. you can get that. So, yeah, our friend Scott yeah. Russell had Stone made fruit. a blackberry blush, excuse me, mm -hmm. a blackberry blush mead that he made for his son's uh, wedding mm -hmm. a number of years ago now. And then he gave us one a couple of years after that, and it was delicious. So it ages and gets better over time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, unlike a lot of the hoppy beers we like to brew, which we want to drink as fresh as possible to get that fresh hop taste, the mead is something you can cellar and, and keep hold of, more like wine. Yeah. yeah, and I really enjoyed this process. It's quite simple. It's easy. You can do it in small spaces. There's not a lot of the equipment. I didn't break out any of my big brewing equipment. I did it mostly on the stove top here and with some glass carboys and airlocks. So it's a simple thing to do. Mm -hmm. uh, it just requires a lot of patience. Yeah. A lot of patience. So, uh, so stay tuned, and we will again have a tasting of the mead when it's ready. Um, meanwhile, we just want to say Happy New Year, and hope you're all well. Thanks for tuning in. Don't forget to hit subscribe and hit the little bell notification to know when we release new videos. And we'll be back with more tips and interviews soon. Happy New Year.